Daniel is an amazing example of a man of wisdom. A man of wisdom. Uh, we're going to look at Daniel again. I spoke a little bit about him last, last week. Uh, I, was, I was thinking this week about hostile environments, and I watched an RTE program about a Tipperary man who, for the last 15 years, he's been farming in Ukraine, in the west of Ukraine, near Lviv. And recently, for reasons you probably know, he evacuated his family out and brought him back to Tipperary. Uh, but then I was watching, as he was speaking on RTE, being interviewed, he said that he's going to go back now and <clears throat> into a hostile environment. Uh, so he's in the West. He was talking about how in the East right now, farmers aren't able to do anything. Their equipment's being confiscated. There are landmines being placed on their fields. So he said that the reason, at least one of the reasons that he's going back is to help support the nation at this time. An Irishman in Ukraine. I, and I just thought that was interesting, uh, considering a hostile environment. And I don't feel like I've ever really lived in a hostile environment, like a, like a war-torn nation. Um, anybody like me, you've never like, lived through what you would say is like, that kind of an extreme, hostile environment. And so I was just kind of pondering it. But um, I was thinking about Daniel, too, because he was a guy who was, he was exiled from his country, Israel, brought as a captive because the Babylonian Empire, the greatest empire in the world at that time, the superpower, took over his nation Ne this guy named Nebuchadnezzar, famous, powerful man, the most powerful man in the world at the time. They c come in, they take the smartest, good-looking, royal-trained men, young men, out of the nation and bring them to his capital. So Daniel's in this hostile environment. And, um, but I was just kind of pondering, so how does Daniel's story apply to me? I mean, I'm in Port Leash, Ireland. I grew up in Alaska. I've had like a peace, peaceful life. Thank you, God. So what does Daniel have to say to me? Like, is there any connections? But there are, obviously. I think you probably knew, understood that. There are, because there's many different types of hostile environments that you can be in. Some of them are extreme, and uh, that is um, important to understand that and not like think, well, yeah, I'm, I'm in a really hostile environment when there are people that are really in hostile environments. But, but there are hostile environments that we live in. I want to show you a few. So this was a place called Sharm El Sheikh on the Red Sea. I went there with my family a number of years ago. And it looks beautiful, doesn't it? It looks like where you want to be on your Easter holiday. At least it does for me. But you know what they did when we were there? They had all the... Um, What's the planks going out, boardwalks going out into the water where you could go swimming? They had all those shut down. Why? Because sharks were eating people. Full of sharks. Dangerous. Does that look like a hostile environment? Yet underneath the surface, there are things that we need to be concerned about. And so during my time there, they had it up. They put it down for a little bit. So Heather and I and my brother... We ran out there and jumped in the water, and then we swam back onto the boardwalk and got out of there. Here's another hostile environment. Doesn't it look beautiful, though? I mean, that is like, I don't know if that's the Swiss Alps, or I don't, it doesn't look that tall, but that looks nice. But do you know what? If you're left there on your own overnight, you'll probably die. But it looks beautiful. Hostile environments. What about this kind of a hostile environment? <laughs> Or this hostile environment, your workplace. What about your couch? You know, you got that box that is bringing you stuff and it looks so good. Or this hostile environment, that looks cool too. Maybe you want to go there on your Easter holidays. Is that, I think that's Times Square. So Daniel, um, <clears throat> Daniel just, 
he navigated hostile environments. And so in order for us to apply this to ourselves, I think we have to do a little bit of thinking. We need to have a bit of wisdom. How many like to be wise? Da Daniel is an amazing example of a man of wisdom. He navigated life, understanding how to move in a right way, in a wise way. And, uh, you know, you'll find in the scriptures over and over again that it talks about um, things that they don't always, they aren't always, things aren't always as they appear. You know what I'm saying? So it says, for example, Satan displays himself as an angel of light. Hostile environments. He doesn't look hostile. He looks good. Okay, good. I, I think you're thinking. So, again, for me, I don't want to look for hostility where there isn't hostility. You know what I'm saying? You know those people? They're, they're seeing, oh, they're bad. That's bad. I don't do that. I'm a... They just think the whole, every, everybody's out to get them. I don't want to be that. You, okay, good. You know, I, I don't want to be that. Yeah, I want to have this discernment to distinguish between what is beautiful and attractive and what is hostile to me. And so I'm praying that we're going to be those people that have that wisdom that Daniel gives us as an example. So we're going to explore Daniel's wisdom. And the first thing I would say is that Daniel's wisdom, it was that he had the ability to, to distinguish between beauty and hostility. I, I think it's, his is an amazing example. So, so let's look at, I'm gonna, I think there's four things, kind of characteristics of a man of wisdom, a young man of wisdom, a young woman of wisdom. We saw a couple of them today. Uh, and how, they, how he journeyed through life with that. So the first thing that I found with Daniel was that he understood that he represented a different kingdom. So the, the question that we ask with that is, who rules? Who's in charge? Who is in charge? You read there that Daniel was brought to Babylon. It's also called, I think, in chapter 1, Shinar, the land of Shinar. You know what Babylon, the land of Shinar, that was the place of, um, where the Tower of Babel was built? Do you remember that story? That was kind of a representation of humanity in opposition to God. How? They wanted to be God. So they built a tower because they were so amazing. They were the Lord of their lives. They were the masters of their destiny. They, were, they didn't take orders. They were the one to give orders. I got a plan for my life. I know where I'm going. And it damned be whoever would tell me different. Because I know where I'm going. I got a plan for my life. Look at me. I'm successful. Look at me. I got it all together. Look what I built. Impressive, isn't it? This was Babylon. The question is, who rules? Daniel was brought from Israel into this environment. It was, and it was an environment, and it looked bad, actually. You know, I, I talked a little bit about it last week. This environment, he's pulled probably from family, friends, community, successful life. He probably had you know, plans for his education, who he was going to be, stripped of all that, brought to a nation that wasn't his, put into their universities, and other bad things happened to him as well that I'm not going to talk too much about. But they call, you know, the guy that was in charge of him was the chief of the eunuchs, and you can look up what that means later this week. So it was a bad situation that he was brought into, and... Um, it says, if you're looking in your Bible, it says that the, the, the king of Israel was in the hand of Babylon. It even says that the vessels of the house of God had been taken. So, so God's house had been disgraced. And it looked like Babylon was stronger than God. 
You ever felt like that? This world looks way more impressive than my life. God, where are you? This was Daniel's experience. I can only imagine. Like, it looked like the world was stronger than God. But then you see in that verse, it says, but the Lord, the Lord gave them into the hand of Babylon. So the whole time God was working, it felt like he had left, but the whole time he was working in their situation. And I think that it was, he, Daniel probably was impressed with where he was coming to. And I was thinking about it for myself. I was remembering, I played basketball as a teenager. And uh, at the beginning of the game, you do what they call a warm-up. So you go out with your team and you go shoot around to get your body warmed up, to, to get everything loose. And then the other team is out on their side of the court. And I remember going out there one time with my team. And whenever you go out there with your team, you're warming up, but you're always looking at the competition, the ones that are against you. You know what I'm saying? And I remember one time seeing them, and they had a few people that could dunk the basketball. And we were like, oh, no, we're dead. We are dead. And I was thinking, Daniel, he arrives in this Babylon, and he's looking over at this powerful nation. And this is who he's up against. And who is he? Like, what does he have that they don't got? So I think he was impressed. I, I think, you know, I, I, I was thinking Babylon at that time was really like the New York City the Tokyo, the, the Dublin, the London, the, the Lagos, the Manila of the world. It was the biggest city in the world. And Daniel was brought from little podunk backwoods Jerusalem into this environment. Imagine yourself as a teenager moving from the countryside in Israel into the big city. So he was probably impressed. Nebuchadnezzar, again, the most powerful man in the, in the world. It's said that the city of Babylon, they've been uncovering the bricks, and nine-tenths of the bricks that were used to build at that time had Nebuchadnezzar's name on them. So this was, and this was an amazing city. And Daniel was right in the midst of that. And so he was educated in the best university, being trained to be an advisor to the most powerful man in the, in the world. And he learned to speak like the Babylonians. He was even named Belteshazzar after the Babylonian god. And then he was going to also be asked to eat at the king's table. But Daniel was different. Daniel was different. He went to the same school. He talked the same talk. But then he was introduced to the king's table. And he said, actually, I can't do this. I can do this, 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 this but I can't do this. How about you? You're living in this world, right? Nod at me if you're living in this world. What's different about you? You do this, 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 this. What won't you do? Is there anything? This is the question, because this is what Daniel, he had discernment between what is beautiful and what's hostile. Re really interesting. And, and Jesus talked about this. Do you remember what he said? He said, I'm sending you out, disciples, Christians, my followers, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. <laughs> Imagine that. <laughs> Go live among the wolves, sheep. You know, he gave instructions how to do that. Say, I'm a sheep. So how do you live as a sheep among wolves? 
Jesus said, be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. You got that kind of wisdom? I was thinking, how is a serpent wise? You tell me. Tell me if you've figured that out. How is a serpent wise? But I'm going to tell you about wisdom because I think Daniel's a great example. All right, here's my definition of wisdom. Wisdom is skillful living under God. Remember, we talked about it already. Who's in charge? What kingdom do I represent? Because I'm living in a kingdom, but what kingdom am I really living in? All right, next one. Number two, resolve. This is Daniel's first thing. So, again, I'm, I'm trying to help us to look at how we live our life here in Ireland, how you li live in your job with the challenges that you face, how you live in your school with the influences coming out to you. How, how do you do that? The, the, the second thing that I see with Daniel is that he had resolve. Look at this passage of scripture here. It says, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food. And I'm thinking, why the king's food? What's the big deal? Just eat the steak, man. Have a drink. It's fine. I mean, you're at the University of Babylon. You're speaking the language. Just eat the steak. What difference does it make? But it made a difference. Daniel wanted to live a life that pleased a different king. You know what I'm saying? And so, you know, I, I was kind of wondering, is this because Daniel was Jewish that he just didn't want to eat non-Jewish food? Or because it was the food was sacrificed to idols, that's why he didn't want to eat this food? Oh, why, why did Daniel just not want to eat this food? But, um, you know, all the food would have been sacrificed to idols. And he still ate. And, and he didn't drink the wine, but Jews were allowed to drink wine. But he said, no, I don't want that. I think the real thing that Daniel was doing here was he was saying that actually, I'm not going to be dependent on that king because I already have a king. He had resolved in his own heart, that might be fine for them, but for me, I'm making this resolve for this thing. All the other things are fine. Babylonian University, speaking the language, they can give me their name. That's fine. But in this thing, that's enough. That's the line. Because he's not really my king. I already have a king. So Daniel said, I'm not going to eat the king's food. And he resolved. Do you have a resolve in your life? Do you have anything that you say, no, that's, I mean, I can do all that, but not that. I was thinking, you know, the, right now I talk to different teenagers and um, they talk about, I want to be an influencer. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I see the, the eyes rolling, influencers. Because, you know, we're, we're older now and we see what's really going on, right? They, you know, you look, these people on the screens, they look good, right? They got the, the makeup, the body, the whatever. And they're trying to um, push a, a lifestyle. Why? They're trying to push a lifestyle so they can sell something to you. Because they want to get something from you. And so I suppose the question that I think about, because it's not bad to be an influencer. It could be good. It could be a calling. I think Daniel's a good example of an influencer. And the reason I think he's a good example is because he understood why he was doing what he was doing. He wasn't just trying to get a bunch of likes, right? You can do that as an influencer. You want to get millions of people watching your content, so you dress good, you look good, you speak well, you make it interesting, and, and then your results grow. And what you do is you're constantly watching your audience. You're saying, what do they want? I'm going to give them what they want. Oh, they really like this video with these words and how I dressed here. So I'm going to give them more of that. But do you know what happens when you're doing that? You're becoming the influenced, not the influencer. And why is that? Because you have no standard. 
You have no resolve within yourself of why am I doing this? The only resolve that you have is that I want everybody to like me. If I could just get everybody to like me, more people to like, 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 like me, then I'll have more influence. But what's your influence? Your influence is just that you're being influenced. You're being pushed. So Daniel is such an amazing example because he has resolve. And I pray for my kids, for the young people, for all of us to be like Daniel. Figure out what is our purpose? What is our resolve? Which king are we going to follow? Daniel had resolve. An amazing influencer. An amazing influencer. So the question I suppose again is, who do I stand for? I know I could say, what do I stand for? Because, but for Daniel, it was, who do I stand for? I have a different king. And so because he had that decision, he had that resolve, it affected what he did and how he lived. Just, uh, just amazing. So the, I, again, in the church, we can do this very easily. We can just be believer Christians. Yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, on the census form, I wrote Christian. That's me. He has no effect on how I live my life at all. I'm no different than anybody else at all. But I am a Christian because on the census form, it says I'm a Christian. But the question is, who do you stand for? Does Jesus actually really affect your life? Is he just a reference point? Oh, yeah, Jesus, check. Or does he encompass your life? Because he calls us to have that kind of relationship with him where he affects us. Okay, let's keep going. Say, good job, Noel. That's a good word. <laughs> okay, let's go. Who do I stand for? Number, number three. Thank you. <laughs> I love that you just tell me what I tell you to tell me. Attractive resistance. I love this. I don't know if somebody said this and I stole it. Heather asked me because I was telling her this last night, this, these two words, attractive resistance. I thought, man, I'm so good. God gave me this. When I was walking, she's like, did somebody else tell you that word? I said, no, I think it was me. I think it was me. Attractive resistance. This is Daniel. I mean, again, there are people in, in our world that, and Christians they're just like resistance, resistance. Everybody's against me. The world is evil. It's all going to hell. And I'm not, I'll have nothing to do with it. Don't get me near those people. They're messed up. I'm better. I'm good. I'm with God. Nobody else is. But Daniel was different than that. Daniel had like an attractive resistance. How do you do that? Daniel, you got skills. So he was able to, what, what, he, what was he able to do? Daniel was able to maintain relational influence with both God and with man. This is outstanding. How did you do that, Daniel? How did you not make everybody around you like not like you, yet you still wholeheartedly followed God? How did you do that? So to many... First of all, I think to many people today, uh, I think if you didn't know Daniel really well, you'd look at him and say, that's a sellout. He's a sellout. He's not a real Christian. Look who ha he hangs out with. He, he literally had a master's degree in Babylonian sorcery. I'm si no joke. He looks like if you were an outsider... And you had your YouTube channel, you know, uncovering evil Christians, you would say Daniel is one of those. And so but Daniel's different. He he wasn't. He wasn't a sellout, actually. Hanging out with these evil people doing evil things, yet he was able to maintain influence. I just think it's it's crazy. And and so um I think that we need to realize that um our walk with God with wisdom, it's more of an art than a science. You know, I like, like, I like it to, to be, I like for God to just tell me exactly what to do once. And then I know 
and then I just do that same thing every time. But do you know that wisdom is more complex than that? It's more of an art. Actually, Jesus said, the wise are known by their fruits. And he said, John the Baptist came wearing camel's hair and eating locusts out in the desert. I came eating and drinking at parties. Wisdom is known by her fruits. Do you see? So there are people, I think, I imagine, like, I was watching Boris Johnson was having his um, meeting with President Zelensky in Ukraine. I watched that, I was looking at that on the news, and I was thinking, I wonder who the Daniel is with Boris Johnson. And I wonder if any Christians would be like, he's a sellout. I wonder if there's a, a, I wonder if there are Daniels in the leadership of Nigeria that, are, that we would say, man, that, they're a sellout. I mean, they're, look who they're hanging out with, that, that guy that they're talking to. But who's the Daniel there? Some of us are called to kind of a black and white thing where we just, you know, we're standing for truth. We're, we're, I think we're like the, the military guys that just go, go into those hostile environments. Black is black, white is white, good is evil, good is not evil, good is good, evil is evil. <laughs> I think there's those people and there's those callings like John the Baptist. And then I think there is a calling like Jesus Christ. You go stand, hang out with the sinners and be with them. And, and be accused of being one because you're hanging out with them. But what does Jesus say? Wisdom is known by her fruits. So be very careful judging those ones that are called to be a Daniel. Right? Okay, that's it. So this <laughs> attractive resistance. Hallelujah. Amen. Lord, have mercy. So Daniel, he says, I can't eat the king's food. And the, the man who was the leader there for him, the chief of the eunuchs, he, he's going, he's asking him. He, Daniel's asking the man in charge of him, can I please not eat the king's food? Again, wisdom. Say wisdom. Daniel had wisdom. I think some of us, we'd be, we'd be going in there and saying, I'm not eating the food. I'm a Christian. I love God. Daniel goes in and says, hey, would it be okay if I don't eat the king's food? And the eunuch says, do you want to get me, the chief of the eunuchs, do you want to get me killed? If you go in looking bad before the king because I didn't give you his food, you know what's going to happen? He's going to kill me. So Daniel has wisdom, and he says to the steward, okay, how about if you test us for 10 days? We'll eat only the vegetables and the water, and after the 10 days, if we look good, if it's okay with you, from then on, we won't eat any of the food of the king, from the king's table. And so the, the steward agreed. He only brought them the, the veg. Imagine. You could be at the steakhouse. You know what I'm saying? But he only took the side of veg. I know, Marlena, it's okay. but <laughs> it's okay. So, so here's Daniel. And, and it wasn't that... So, right, you, I think you know what happens. He ends up, after the 10 days, they test him. And he, it says he's fatter than all of the rest. Was that... This is supernatural stuff going on. It wasn't that the veg and stuff was just better for him. Actually, it wasn't. This was the king's food. It was the good food. It was going to make you strong. It was going to make you good, good looking, whatever. Uh, but something shifted. It was a supernatural work of God. It wasn't, about, it wasn't about being vegan or vegetarian or being a meat eater, whatever. It was about God. God entered into Daniel's resolve to decide I'm going to eat this because I have a different king. God steps in, and he looks better. And, but he did it in such an amazing way. With wisdom, he didn't destroy the relationship with the chief of the eunuchs. 
He said, okay, let's see, let's see how can we work this out. Lord, give me wisdom. How can I keep this connection with this guy? I don't want to step on his toes. I want to live a life of honor that I keep my relationship and influence connected with this person. Yet I also want to serve you first, Lord. That's the most important. I'm willing to risk. But is there a way for me to navigate where I hold both of these together in tension? Daniel's just an amazing example. And yeah, I, I got to keep going. I got so many different things that I want to share. But um, let's look at the next one. So this is what happens. Yeah, yeah. Will I enda- you would endanger my head with the king. This is what the eunuch is saying to him. Daniel said to the steward whom the chief eunuchs had signed over them, test your servant for 10 days. Okay. Yes. Okay, number four. Costly. Costly. So we want to be people of wisdom like Daniel navigating our journey, representing a different kingdom, being different, having an attractive resistance, yet we need to realize that there will be a cost. I mean, I think it's so clear what Daniel's cost was. Three years eating veg and water. Oh, man. That, I mean, sincerely, that was a cost. Uh, giving up the ribeyes. <laughs> he was just, he was aligning his life under a different king. And uh, I love, I love, there's a, a missionary to Ecuador. He said, he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain what he cannot lose. He's no fool who gives what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. The Daniel understood the cost and the reward outweighed the cost. Living for God was so much more important to him that he was willing to risk his life in order to have a resolve and make a stand for what he felt God wanted him to do. Because he wasn't under this king. He was under this king. Just beautiful. Let me, let's look at the results. And the king spoke with them after the three years. And among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Those are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore, they stood before the king. And in every matter of wisdom... And understanding about which the king inquired of them, he found them 10 times, I think it's a bit of hyperbole there, 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all his kingdom. And Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. This is, I I love this last verse because this is showing Daniel is here in this moment and he's a teenager. he's, He's made this resolve He made this decision about who was going to be king in his life. And now we see that he he was there in Babylon until the first year of King Cyrus. That's, That's that Daniel lived and served four kings. He began with Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon. Daniel continued on through the kingship of Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's son. He continued on. Through the king of the Medes, Darius, he continued on till the first year of Cyrus, 60 something, de- six, six decades, over six decades of a life serving God in a crazy world, in a hostile environment. And he looked like a sellout, but actually he was a man of integrity who kept both influence with God and influence with men. Let's stand and let's pray today. So there's just, I just have uh, one question for you that I, I, I'd like to put up on the screen for you to consider this week. And that is, who do I really stand for?
And I just want to mention as well that the reward far outweighs any cost. And you know what? You can, do this, you can answer this question with a smile on your face because our God is a good God. He has actually purposes for us. He has things that we're called to. And that sometimes, even on the first week of Easter break 2022, a resolve or a decision that we make today or this week could have a whole effect of the trajectory of our next 60 years. Isn't that, I think that's amazing. That, that one moment could really, you know, like that bow and arrow, you just move it a little bit and it totally shifts the direction that the arrow is going. So let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this moment, uh, this holy moment, Lord. And thank you for what you're doing in people's lives, all sorts of different things around this room. Lord, uh, thank you that um, you love us, Lord. Thank you that you are a good God. You're, you're for us and not against us. And Lord, for those who are here today who are a little bit discouraged about their current circumstances, probably like Daniel was, like what is going on with my life? I pray, Lord, that you would just drop something into their heart through your Holy Spirit of encouragement and faith today. That, Lord, that they would again look and make that strong resolve that you are their king and that they're going to follow you, Lord. So we give you our lives today, Lord. If you want to just lift your hands um, as just that representation, Lord, we belong to you. Lord, we want to stand for you. Lord, we pray that you would give us wisdom for every environment that we enter into, God. Thank you that you promise never leave us or forsake us because we belong to you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.